So we got a problem here. There's kind of this, um, yeah, pervasive problem in science that nobody seems to be ready to talk about. And it's the sort of problem that could basically unravel any paper's conclusions. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. And what exactly is that problem, you might be asking? Why? It is the linearity slash additivity. It is the linearity. It is the... It is the additivity assumption. Or the violation of the additivity assumption. Why, whatever do you mean, young man? Boy, I'm glad you asked that, especially in that smashing accent. So, most people know that in statistics we make assumptions, although nobody checks them. See, link in the description. By the way, uh, a YouTube commenter, uh, like a week or two ago, suggested that it might be beneficial for me to put references to the things that I'm saying. So, I've started doing that. I'm kind of treating these videos as a paper now, where I <laughs> actually have to back up the stuff that I'm saying. <sighs> Sucks to be a scientist sometimes. Sometimes you just want to make it up. Yes, most people don't check their assumptions. And when they do, you want to know what I find funny? Like, they check for the normality assumption. Like, there are other assumptions besides normality, but everybody checks normality assumption. You want to know why that's funny? Because normality assumption basically doesn't matter. Because the thing is, is the central limit theorem basically guarantees that any sample with a large enough sample size, its distribution of means is normal. And so you can have super skewed data and it doesn't really matter. I'm pretty sure I'm putting a reference to that statement too. Anyway, and in addition, we have homoscedasticity, which is uh, slightly more problematic to violate. Nobody checks it. And then there's independence. I think people kind of, so I mean, you don't really need to check the independence assumption because it's more of a design issue. But I think people are aware of it for the most part. And I will say that the independence assumption, it's not a good idea to violate it. I was once told as an undergraduate by a stats professor by the name of... Can't remember his name. Cool guy though. Uh, he said of all the assumptions to violate, the worst assumption to violate is the independence assumption. I disagree with him. And there's a good reason why. Violating the assumption of independence means that you are generally going to make overly optimistic conclusions. Increase your probability of type 1 error. P-values are going to be smaller, confidence intervals are going to be tighter than they should be. But at least, or at least in general, the nature of the relationship is correct. So for example, you might say group A has a higher mean than group B. And so you might get a type 1 error, but generally you're not going to reverse course and say that group B is higher than group A. But with the additivity assumption, um, that doesn't hold anymore. If you violate the additivity assumption, you could completely misunderstand the nature of the relationship. And so additivity combines two things. One is linearity. We assume that there is a linear relationship between the predictive variable and the outcome. And the other is the homogeneity of regression slopes, which basically says that there are no unmodeled interactions in the model. And both these combined are, I label as additivity, and I'm not the only one. I think Gelman and Hill also label it as additivity. And both these assumptions basically say there are no multiplicative effects. Now, that was a lot of technical jargon. Let's go ahead and use an example so you don't um, exit my video prematurely and make me sad. Please stay. All right, so let me give an example. Let's say the true model looks like this. Y is equal to B0 plus B1X plus B2X2 plus B3Z plus B4XZ. Or X times Z, which is an interaction. But let's pretend that you actually fit this model. Y is equal to B0 plus B1X plus B2Z. Or in other words, you have missed the two multiplicative effects, X squared and X times Z. So the additivity assumption states that any multiplicative effects, like in this case, X squared and X times Z, have been modeled. If they haven't been modeled, you in trouble. And violating this assumption is like a massive problem, like huge. And let's look at an example. Let's check out this lovely plot here. So there, these are two different models being fit to the same data. In the plot on the left, we have a linear model between stress and suicide ideation. And in the plot on the right, we have a nonlinear model. And so let's just say you're a therapist doing your own data analysis and you have this data set. And you want to know, all right, my subject is at risk of suicide. What do I do? 
the model on the left says, oh, you know what you need to do? You need to decrease stress because in this model, decreasing stress always, always decreases suicide ideation. But if you actually consider the non-additivity of the model or the multiplicativity, oh, that was fun to say, you would notice that actually, if they are super understressed, decreasing stress is a bad idea because it makes them more likely to commit suicide. So for values of stress between, I don't know, four and 10, it's actually beneficial to add stress to their life. And that actually makes sense that if you have somebody who is completely, that if you have somebody who is bored and has nothing to do, they have no stress in their life and making life easier for them is probably not gonna be a good idea. Now let's think about what happens. If you believe the additive model, you could kill people. And worse, your statistical model is wrong. Hey, needs to sort out his priorities. That was a joke. Obviously, it's worse to kill people. Anyway, now that's an example with a nonlinear effect. Now let's think about an example with an interaction effect. So again, we have a linear model or an additive model on the left that shows that the relationship between suicide ideation and depression is linear. And the more depression you have, the more you idealize suicide. Very simple relationship, but that is a misguided relationship. It is oversimplified. The relationship actually looks like the plot on the right. This model suggests that the relationship between your depression and your suicide ideation totally depends on your best friend's suicide ideation. If your best friend has like no suicide ideation tendencies, then there's basically no relationship between the two. But if your best friend has super high suicide ideation tendencies, then there is a massive increase in suicide ideation as you increase in depression. And again, that could have disastrous consequences if you believe the model on the left when the model on the right is the right model. So do you see how additivity is kind of a big deal? Because you're not just like increasing your probability of type one error or even type two error. You're just completely misunderstanding the nature of the relationship. That's bad. So how do you avoid failing to meet this assumption? Really, there's only one way to do it. Only one way. And the answer is like so simple. I don't, I'm surprised more people don't do it. The only way to do it is to take a simplistics class. That's it. All you gotta do is take a simplistics class. I'm kidding, of course, kind of. I mean, you'll learn how to do it in simplistics class. But I figured I'd put my plug in the middle of the video because a lot of people leave the video early and they don't know that I uh, like to make money. So to make sure that never happens, I'm putting it in the video. All right, we ready to move on? So let's think about the implications of this. So the implications of the additivity model is that there cannot be any sort of unmodeled interaction effects and there cannot be any sort of unmodeled nonlinear effects. So that's like super important. And the best way to do that is to start with visualizing the data. And then from the visuals, you can tell whether there's a nonlinear effect and you can tell whether there are interaction effects. By the way, I've said this a couple times, that's opposite of what most people do. Most people begin by fitting models and then if they find like an interaction effect that is significant, then they might plot data, but not the raw data. They just plot a visual representation of what the model is saying. So there's no way to actually evaluate whether these assumptions have been met. So you might be asking like me, like, WTF, why is nobody talking about this? If it's such a big deal, why does nobody talk about it? I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I might earn it. I minored in statistics and I don't remember them ever talking about the additivity assumption. Maybe they talked about linearity, but I don't think they ever talked about this assumption that we call homogeneity of regression, which basically says there are no interactions between any of the variables. But I have a uh, suspicion why this isn't talked about much. Like I said earlier and have said multiple times, most people model first and then plot maybe. And so if you are relying on models to evaluate the additivity assumption, that's really hard to do. Because let's say you have five predictor variables in the model. In order to evaluate whether any of these interact with one another, you would have to explicitly model a bunch of interaction effects. And let me see if I remember the math right that uh, if you have five variables, it's gonna be five times four, 20 divided by two you're gonna have 10 different two-way interactions, not to mention all the three-way interactions, the four-way interactions, and the one five-way interaction. So that's super, super tedious 
to fit models with all these possible interactions and then see which ones are viable interactions that you should keep in the model. Not to mention any sort of nonlinear effects that would be fixed with a polynomial. Like, if you are going into it blind, meaning without looking at the data, it's basically an impossible task. And a related point about why possibly people don't do this, um, it's very common to control for a bunch of variables. So a lot of papers might have like 10 things they're controlling for. And again, your assumption is that none of those 10 things interact with each other and none of those 10 things interact with the variables that you're actually interested in. And in order to evaluate that, that's a whole lot of either plotting or a whole lot of modeling to figure out which ones might have interactions. And it just becomes super cumbersome to investigate all possible interactions and all possible nonlinear effects. I think another reason why it's never talked about is because it's really hard to explain, at least concisely. And it also, it, it's in this weird situation, like, if you violate the assumption of normality, um, that basically tells you, you shouldn't do linear models, you need to do like a generalized linear model, or you need to do a transformation on the data. There's some sort of fix that you have to do. And I guess you could say the same thing about the homogeneity, about the homoscedasticity assumption. But uh, the additivity one is kind of weird in that if you violate the additivity assumption, the way to fix it is to model the multiplicative effect. Like, it's a very simple solution. You just, okay, you originally thought that there might not be an interaction. Turns out there is. Okay, you need to include that in the model. That's kind of a, okay, now I've met the assumption. So it's kind of weird. It stands on its own in terms of assumptions that um, its fix is very easy and and all the resources you need to fix it are right there in the model and I think um, and I think it's like it's a tricky one because it's very hard to state succinctly what the additivity assumption is and so I will give it a succinct statement about what it means right now but it has a bunch of words that you have to know what they mean in order to understand what I'm saying but I'm gonna give it anyway so the additivity assumption says that we assume that all variables only have additive effect unless explicitly modeled. Or I guess another way of putting it is all non-additive effects or all multiplicative effects have been modeled explicitly. That's all the assumption states. So you might be asking yourself, okay, cool. How do I do it? How do I make sure I have met the assumption of additivity? How do I make sure I have identified and modeled all multiplicative effects? That there is a fine question. And the simple answer is that we build the model using visuals first. We first visualize the data and then use the visuals to inform the type of model that we fit. And if you want to see me tackle that problem on a real data set, then I invite you to take a simplistics class. So I'm making a second video that's gonna be available to those who register for my simplistics class. I have both live classes and not so live classes or on-demand classes. My next live class, I think is gonna be February, 2025. And then the on-demand class, you can take at any time. So I'm gonna leave links in the description to those classes so you can register and learn more about how to evaluate and fix the additivity problems that might be there in your data set. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. Wait, I totally forgot to mention that I've got a Black Friday deal going on. So now through the end of the month, you can use the coupon code linked in the description to get 25% off of your Simplistics order. So what are you waiting for? All right, peace out.